Good evening, everyone, and welcome to MyDNA Health's live webinar on autoimmunity and how nutrigenomic testing can help in managing autoimmune conditions. The webinar is scheduled to last about 50 minutes, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Hopefully, it's going to be informative and very enjoyable. So, just a little bit about our presenter this evening, Dr. Eve Pierce. Eve has a PhD in medicine and an undergraduate degree in medical biochemistry. She has over a decade of genetic and medical research experience and has recently joined MyDNA Health scientific team. Following her PhD, Eve joined the University of Southampton's Genetic Lab and a research, as a research fellow, and during this time published a number of research papers in medical journals and also trained medical students. Eve's passion for wellness and nutrition led her to complete an ION diploma in nutritional therapy, and she currently provides dietary clinic services for an NHS weight management program. Her clinical interests include genetics and epigenetics, of course, nutritional dietetics, nutritional biochemistry, and cancer research. I'm sure you'd all agree that Eve is highly qualified, and tonight she will share a lot of interesting scientific insights into epigenetics and nutrigenomics, and a lot of practical insights on how to manage autoimmune cases. So a little bit about our webinar platform. As you may have already noticed, we have a chat widget on our left-hand side, and this is where you can ask all your questions all throughout the webinar. We want to make this webinar as interactive as possible, so don't be shy and ask away. And if you are feeling shy, you can choose to post a question only to presenters and we'll be sure to answer it. If you can't stay with us for the entire time, don't worry, we'll be sending out the webinar recording and notes to all those who have registered. And just one last thing before we start, let's do a quick poll. So do you use nutrigenomic testing in your practice? You can start voting now. Okay, I see the results coming in. So most of you are planning to start genetic testing. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. And we are ready to start. So over to you, Eve. Great, thank you for that kind introduction, Sylvia. Um, it's really interesting to me that many of you are either already using the nutrigenomic testing or majority of you are actually planning to. So I think that's quite exciting because when I started my career in genetics, um, which was last century now, um, the effort that I had to go to to even produce um, one SNP result from two from two people for, from a control and a patient took me weeks of effort and um, this was sort of pre um, the human genome project so we were kind of fishing around in the dark as well and since then there's been a revolution in genetics that I've been witness to and is and now is coming out into nutrigenomics and for us as nutritional therapists I think it's really important um, and we should really sort of go for this technology and, and embrace it and not be afraid of it and really sort of take it on board and in, incorporate it as another tool in our toolbox. So it's not the only option, but it is a good tool and it's, it's very relevant. So let's just look at our session overview. Um, I will be giving an overview of genetic susceptibility to this uh, group of autoimmune conditions. And as we know, it's a group and how genetics has identified some candidate genes. So these are genes that may be uh, related to autoimmunity, um, but haven't been fully researched yet. Moving on to the importance of epigenetics, and we'll be discussing two mechanisms involved in this. So we'll be looking at uh, methylation pathways and chromatin regulation. Then we will look at the importance of epigenetics in autoimmunity conditions. And we'll look at which genes when tested in nutrigenomic panels might give us some clues in autoimmune cases. And then finally, we will look at some combined genetics and epigenetics results in a real life case study. So as an introduction, there are over 100 diseases which are confirmed as having an autoimmune origin and many more for which there's strong scientific evidence for autoimmune uh, autoimmune origins. There is a huge variety in symptoms, so from the red itchy plaques that we see in psoriasis to that debilita debilitating back pain and the neck pain of ankylosing spondylitis. The, the causes of these conditions all have the same foundation. 
our immune system, which is supposed to protect us from invading microorganisms, um, turns against us and effectively attacks our own cells instead. So which cells are the target of this attack determines the type of autoimmune disease and the symptoms from that. This uh, graph that you can see here on the right is from a 2002 study um, that was quite a big study in America and it notes the incidence in an American population showing the dramatic rise of three autoimmune conditions, so multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease and type 1 diabetes um, since the 1950s and they've also included asthma as an immune mediated condition there as well and you can see that has risen hugely since 1980s. So I think this is all quite startling evidence for the increase of autoimmune diseases. But let's look at the major contributors to autoimmune disease. Um, these can be linked to genetic susceptibility. Uh, and this is down to the DNA code, which we all inherited from our parents and which we carry in every cell. Then in this sort of Venn diagram we're creating, if we add in some environmental influences, so this is relevant to us as NT, so very much our diet and our lifestyle factors and the choices that we make throughout our life and how these um, accumulate. And then if we add in immune regulation or really the dysregulation in the case of autoimmune disease and we can also put in this bracket, we could put in infection triggers and inflammation problems and that, that chromic low grade um, inflammation that can be present in many of our clients. And then finally, this these factors can all come together to create this perfect storm of conditions in a way um, where antibodies or cells react against ourselves, and this is known as autoimmunity. And in effect, our immune systems become unable to distinguish between self, non-self, or invader, and, and this is kind of known as a loss of self-tolerance. So let's look a bit deeper into this and how these three factors that we've discussed fit into the overall pathogenesis of autoimmunity. And it's believed that that self-tolerance that I talked about is the, um, the breakdown of it results from a combination of, our, so we have here the genetic susceptibility, where certain susceptibility genes on our, from our chromosomes in our nuclei lead to that failure of self-tolerance by influencing lymphocytes to become self-reactive. And then if we add in the um, environmental stimuli, we can see that this works together with the genetic susceptibility um, and whether it's the dietary, lifestyle, infectious agents, it could be a tissue injury or information here. Um, this can lead to activation and the display of self-antigens on antigen-presenting cells. So that's the activation of tissue APCs you see there on the right. And, and that causes an influx of these self-reactive lymphocytes into tissues, which um, really is the trigger trigger issue for that autoimmunity and, and then we can see that moves into um, allowing that immune dysregu dysregulation to come in and, and that's in the form of activation of self-reactive lymphocytes uh, and, and this results in that injury to the tissues and the autoimmune symptoms depending on which um, autoimmune disease. So the medical establishment currently offers no cure for um, autoimmune conditions. And they can be very challenging to diagnose, um, as it often presents as a collection of vague symptoms. Um, and I think this is very relevant to us as NTs, so such as fatigue, headaches, muscle, joint aches. I think these are things that we see regularly in clinic um, and we could pinpoint to many, many of our clients. And often these symptoms are dismissed as signs of getting insufficient sleep working too hard or stress or just general sort of work hard, play hard lifestyle. And um, I was sort of looking around for information about this and I uh, came across the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association and they um, did a questionnaire to many of their followers last year and they found that 45% of patients um, suffering a serious autoimmune disease were labelled as hypochondriacs um, in the early stages of their illness. 
And I think that that is um, quite astounding, really, because that's just the serious autoimmune diseases that they have labelled as serious. And, and really, 45% is a huge percentage. So many people really um, not having a lot of um, sympathy from their medical team. So that medical treatment, again, yep, there's no cure. So the medical establishment currently offers no cure for autoimmune conditions. And the management varies with the, the, the disease. So generally, there will be hormone replacement for the disease for diseases due to a hormone insufficiency. So think about here type 1 diabetes or Hashimoto's. Um, then the corticosteroids can be often used and they are put in to suppress the immune system, so dampen it down. Um, they could have unwanted side effects, so think about the effects of putting those glucocorticoids into the system. Um, for a very ill patient, um, stronger immune suppressant drugs are used, but these come with even greater risks. Um, so they can be very risky. Think of the issues of not having an effective immune system. Um, and then, of course, pain medication, and we know some of the issues and symptoms and the side effects that go along with many of these, uh, and those are prescribed where appropriate. And typically, diet and lifestyle modifications are not currently included in the treatment protocols, um, and, and many, many patients in the UK don't get specific dietary advice related to their autoimmune uh, condition. So, the genetic factors at play in autoimmunity are very complex. Um, this is in contrast to many uh, inherited diseases in which um, a mutation, so a genetic variation in a single gene or, an, or a small number of genes directly causes the disease. So think of things such as the BRCA1 related to the breast cancer. I'm sure we've all heard of that. Uh, that's a very much a, a small change which has been directly related to breast cancer incidents. And research is still identifying these susceptibility genes um, in, a, in a wide variety of autoimmune conditions. So the research is very much still current and going on. So autoimmune diseases tend to ha um, run in families. Uh, and there are known to be a greater rates of disease between identical twins than non-identical twins, and then between siblings. And this is then compared to the general population rates. So if we have a look at type 1 uh, diabetes, these rates of concordance are um, 30 to 40 percent in identical twins, 0 to 13 percent in uh, non-identical twins, 6% in siblings and a population prevalence of 0.4%. And this is from some uh, research from 2003 that pulled together a, a huge number of um, research studies. So next, uh, we can look at multiple sclerosis rates. We have 25% in identical twins, 0-5% uh, in non-identical twins, 3-5% uh, to 5 in siblings, and a 0-1% population prevalence. And we can move on to lupus. So we have 24 to 57, so one of the highest for the identical twins there. Non-identical twins at 2 to 5 percent. Siblings again 2 to 5 percent, and a population prevalence of 0.2 percent, so relatively low in the general population. And, and then uh, a more common one, the rheumatoid arthritis. So in identical twins, 12 to 14 to 15 percent. Sorry. Uh, Non-identical twins at about three to four percent, siblings at two to four, and a population prevalence of 0.2 to one percent. So it was, um, it's this higher concordance that we see between these so monozygotic identical twins. So these are twins which carry exactly the same genetic code within their cells, within their nuclei. And this is really what led research to investigate a genetic contribution to autoimmunity. So before we discuss that a bit further, let's just um, talk a little bit more about understanding human genetic variation. Um, as a species, humans are relatively young in that we've not had much time to evolve genetically and produce variations. Uh, I believe we're only about 400,000 years old. 
we each have approximately 3 billion base pairs of DNA and no two people are genetically identical except for those monozygotic identical twins. On average, any two people can have about 6 million base pairs which are different. Um, this may seem like a lot, but is actually only 0.1% of our genome. And around the world, um, all populations of humans are essentially the same. And as we know, as nutritional therapists, the differences lie in the individual and, and we should be treated as such. So if we move on a bit further into genetic variations, um, these are heritable alterations in the DNA sequence. So once they've occurred, they will be passed on from mother to son or father to daughter. And um, these contribute to the phenotypic variation. So that's the individual characterization, um, sometimes by changing either the gene expression or sometimes by changing the gene function. So there's two pathways there. And it's studying these genetic variants or these gene variants which provides the clues to understanding the pathogenic mechanisms involved in disease. So recent advances in gene expression analysis have allowed some high throughput SNP genotyping. I'm sure you've all heard of SNPs. Um, the, um, the types of genetic variation can be large scale or can be small scale. So large scale variations can involve the loss or gain of whole chromosomes or the rearrangement of these. And you can see on the right, there's a diagram that shows the um, traditional sort of cell diagram that you have and then there's the nucleus and inside we have the chromosomes and um, the whole sort of arms of these chromosomes can be moved or rearranged and, and those are really huge changes um, and in this case you really be thinking about some cancers um, you can lose sort of whole areas and that will lead to cancers that way and you'd be surprised what we can get away with um, not having genetically so if we think about males, for instance, they are missing half of one of their chromosomes and they seem to get along just fine. Um, so these small scale variations, if we move down, so we're moving down along, we have the chromosome and then that's unpacking. We can see those chromatin regulations there. Those are chrom uh, chromatin proteins that go in and wrap the DNA. That's unwinding and then we get to that sort of double helix that we can see that we're all very familiar with. And those are the small scale um, uh, base substitutions effectively. So that's the single nucleotide polymorphism or the SNP. And um, the this, this small scale ones are at the base pair level, and the majority of which are base substitutions, and these are known as SNPs. So um, the, the recent advances in gene expression analysis have allowed this high throughput SNP genotyping that I mentioned. And this technique really uses um, very advanced technology, which is amazing, amazingly technical this day and, and always sort of surprises me when I see it in the lab. And this technique looks at the single base changes in the DNA code across a whole genome, known as a genome wide association study. So you can see here on the diagram on the right, we have that SNP. So there's a C to G change in the double helix has switched over to a T to A. Uh, and these are really looked at across the whole genome. Uh, so many hundreds of thousands of SNPs are analyzed at once in that a high throughput uh, GWA study. So to carry out a GWA study, researchers use two groups of participants. So there will be people with the disease being studied. Um, so that's on the left. And then we will have a similar matched uh, group of people without the disease. So they're all carefully chosen so that they are relevant to the, the, um, the case, so the autoimmune disease cases. Uh, and these are known as controls. And each person's complete set of DNA is purified um, from blood or from cells. And, and this is placed onto tiny chips uh, to be scanned for the SNPs. So this is that high throughput uh, SNP analysis in action there. And then underneath, we have kind of a diagrammatic representation of um, the, the chips. And if certain genetic variations are found to be significantly more frequent in those who have the disease compared to controls, um, these become known as significantly associated with the disease and then they move on to becoming those candidate genes. So they are a candidate in the disease. 
So one of the first GWA studies performed was in systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE. Uh, and SNPs across the entire genome of SLE patients were compared with healthy controls. And it was established that over 20 loci, so a loci is an area of the chromosome. It can be a huge area um, containing many hundreds of SNPs in each area um, contain and in each one contains lupus associated genes. And um, so the SLE was studied, if um, we think back to those monozygotic um, twin data, that was the higher data there. So to date, this rarer autoimmune disease remains one of the most genetically cat categorized and understood autoimmune conditions. Over 40 areas of the genome and hundreds of SNPs have been associated with SLE, uh, and many of which involve cytokine regulation. So I pulled this table from a study, uh, one of the big studies that's pulled all the information together. And this is just literally the top of the table. This would go sort of right down the bottom of your screen out to the floor. Uh, and you can see here many uh, reported genes, many candidate genes there, some of which are involved in cytokine regulation. So GWA studies in autoimmune diseases are rapidly increasing. Um, this research is going on all the time. It's quite a big area of research right now. And new loci are being associated all the time. So this data is ever increasing. Um, I pulled out these seven autoimmune diseases. And these alone have been associated with over 286 loci and many more individual SNPs from that. So just think about how many SNPs in that. So we have ankylosing spondylitis with 13 loci, rheumatoid arthritis with 30, that lupus with the 40, type 1 diabetes with the 40, multiple sclerosis with 52, Crohn's disease with 67, and the ulcerative colitis with 44. So these um, general studies are useful to allow further re scientific research to now go and look at these susceptibility genes, so these candidate genes. And this research is then starting to characterize the function of these genes using biological studies. But this really is in its infancy, um, and it will take many years to um, come to fruition and really be understood. So really, the important question for us is, um, where does this leave nutrigenomics in the context of autoimmunity for us as nutritional therapists? Because from this, it's quite overwhelming. Let's go back and look at our family studies. So if autoimmunity was down to genetic variation alone, identical twins would have 100% concordance. And these twin studies clearly demonstrate that genes are often insufficient to cause autoimmunity and other factors are required. Um, epigenetics involves the inheritable genetic factors other than a person's DNA sequence. So if we move on to looking at epigenetics, these are highly modif modifiable by diet and lifestyle, as we know. And in the case of autoimmunity, two genetically identical twins can experience different disease symptoms due to their different environment. So on the right, we have the um, diagram showing that the diet and lifestyle effects are one side. That's the epigenetics. And then we have those genetic. And in this case, we'll be discussing the single nucleotide polymorphisms or the SNPs from the bottom. So. Humans are vertebrates, um, and we have quantitatively more DNA than lower eukaryotes. And this requires another level of modification to regulate our gene expression. Um, methyl groups, um, so a methyl group is um, the uh, a carbon with three hydrogens attached, which I'm sure you're all becoming aware of, can be added to these side sign bases. And, and so that's only the C base on the DNA. And, and that um, is in these islands. They're known as CPG islands. So in specific areas of the genome only. They're not sort of randomly across the genome. They have to be in specific areas.
Sorry, if I just go back to that last get slide again. So these eukaryotes, such as ourselves, we require this larger amount of DNA, and we're made up of multiple cell types. Um, this large amount of DNA is packaged into our cell nuclei. So again, we have that same diagram again. And the packaging mechanism has two purposes for us. That's for storage, because uh, it needs to fit into our nuclei and to alter our gene expression. So here we have that, um, you can see that uh, methyl group is being added to the cytosine uh, base there, and that's the methylation. So that's uh, the diagram just of the cytosine bases. And that's really our final, finer level of um, gene expression that we experience as these sort of very high vertebrates with lots of DNA, very complicated. So these methyl groups that we've been talking about, these effectively tag our DNA to activate or repress our genes. So we can see here we've got a, this is a T cell, there's um, the nuclei, we have the DNA inside, and then to the right we have uh, a representation of the double helix, and there's two methyl groups, um, they would be attached to the C base there. So Therefore, methylation of DNA has, can have a profound effect on how genes are expressed and then ultimately on our cellular tissue and our whole body function. So let's just talk a little bit about DNA methylation and autoimmunity. Altered methylation of DNA in T cells, and in particular this is hypomethylation, so a loss of me uh, methylation that reduction in methyl tags is known to contribute to autoimmunity. So again, at the top we have a normal T cell, and there's two, this representation has got two methyl tags. And then underneath we have an autoimmune cell that's gone into um, sort of that loss of self tolerance mode, and we have a reduction in the methylation status of the DNA there. So what factors really affect our DNA methylation? It's known that um, dietary, lifestyle and environmental factors such as nutrition, alcohol, smoking, physical activity, body weight, our medications that we take, the toxins that are all around us in all the products and infections all influence our methylation status. And this is why using lifestyle questionnaires is so important and I think as NTs we value these. We all know how important they are, and we can use these alongside, so in addition to any nutrigenomics, and we can put these both together to assess the epigenetic impact. So, in addition, it's known that the, the effects of dietary and lifestyle modifications on DNA methylation um, can be additionally modified by common genetic variants. So, these are the SNPs. Um, we can use nutrigenomic testing to assess an individual's methylation cycle function and, and it affects their capability to methylate or tag DNA. So let's just look at how can epigenetics can help us understand autoimmunity. Um, this is a representation of the methylation cycle pathway as a whole and it's the intersection of four important biochemical pathways in the body. Uh, driven by that need for the methyl groups. So at the end we have the production of the SAMI, one of our major methyl donors. And um, These four pathways centre around methionine cycling, uh, the folate cycle, a BH4 cycle and the urea cycle. Um, methylation takes place over a billion times a second in the body uh, and it can be likened to those functioning cogs and wheels uh, and they, it needs to glide smoothly. Reduced efficiency of this cycle um, affects DNA synthesis and methylation. And studies have very much shown that autoimmune T cells have defects due to the changes in this methylation cycle. So it's not only down to our diet and lifestyle, we need to take into account these methylation cycle changes. So the there are chem um, several common genetic variants of genes, highly um, and these are all highly involved in the methylation cycle. And 
I've highlighted these on the diagram. So we have the um, MTHFR, which I'm sure you all have heard of and are aware of. Then we have MTR and MTRR, which are partners, and we'll be looking at these a bit more in detail in a moment. We have the CBS, which uh, moves um, homocysteine out. That's the first step of moving homocysteine from the methylation cycle. And then finally, at the bottom, we have the um, COMPT gene, which is responsible for um, recycling those catch colonies. And they can ha these all have um, an influence on methylation SNPs, um, methylation status. And the SNPs of these genes have all been linked to autoimmune disease and are known to be modifiable by diet and lifestyle. So as we can see from this diagram, proper functioning of the methylation machinery is essential in many areas of health. And this includes energy levels, immune function, cardiovascular health, brain health, and liver function. And the genetic variants in key parts of the methylation cycle can cause too much or too little of certain chemicals. And this can affect our health and balance. So a reduced efficiency in methylation cycle or under methylation leads to a number of deficiencies in essential nutrients. Um, we would see those high histamine levels, lower homocysteine, and a reduced serotonin level in the brain. Uh, so symptoms can include obsessive compulsive tendencies, tension, phobias, a, a low tolerance to pain, um, allergy symptoms, and a, a low mood. On this, the flip side with the overmethylation, so this is a methylation cycle which is working too fast, um, consumes an increased level of cofactors, and that's hard for the body to keep up with. So at first sight, it may seem like a good idea to have overmethylation because it's so crucial to us, but actually, it can lead to some burnout, and this also leads to a lower histamine levels, uh, higher homocysteine, and high serotonin levels in the brain. So symptoms revolve around anxiety, um, you could have a food or chemical sensitivity, ADHD, low motivation, um, you could become overweight, restless legs, sleep disorders, and paranoia, and there's uh, a longer list are available. So let's just look and focus in on the relevant genetic variants of the methylation cycle for us. So we have here the MTHFR gene, so um, this is the central enzyme in the methylation pathway. It's really the gateway between the two. And the two SNPs which are of interest are MTHFR677, that's the C to, G, uh, C to T change. And then we have MTHFR1298, that's an A to C change. We have the MTR gene, so that catalyzes the remethylation of homocysteine from the thionine, so it's involved in that recycling. We, and the SNP we're looking at is MTR2756, and that's an A to G change. MTR catalyzes the methocobalamin, and that's a key cofactor of MTR. And the SNP we're looking at here is MTRR66, A to G change. We have the CBS um, gene. This catalyzes the conversion of homocysteine to cystothionine. That's that removal of homocysteine, the first step of that pathway. And the SNP we're interested in is CBS 278A to G change. And finally, we have the COMP gene. Um, this catalyzes the transfer of methyl groups to the catch colonies, including dopamine, so involved in their sort of recycling removal. And um, this is sometimes known as the warrior or warrior gene, so uh, warrior with an A and warrior with an O. And the SNP we're looking at is COMPT 472 G to A change. So therefore, knowing a client's SNP profile combined with diet and lifestyle questionnaires can give us some big clues in autoimmune conditions and really allow us to develop an individual nutritional protocol designed to optimize health, which again, I think as um, nutritional therapists, we can all really um, relate to. Thus, using a multifaceted approach is needed, whereby we take into account the SNPs, the lifestyle, the diet, environment, their mental outlook, your client's nutrition, and the sleep quality, and this requires patience from both you and the client. It can take some time, um, needs education, 
uh, it can take time to work through, but it is worth it. So let's move on now and look at a real life case study. So this is um, S, a 40 year old female, a non-smoker, moderate drinker, exercises three times a week, has a BMI of 29, so in the overweight bracket, and a waist to hip ratio, which is 0.96, so that's uh, above optimal, so above the 0.8, uh, indicating some sensual obesity there. Uh, questionnaire results are showing as um, food cravings being severe, stress, uh, adrenal burnout, sleep, and weight and cortisol, so that's the risk of cortisol um, affecting weight, so that's central obesity again, so we could see that in the previous slide, are all moderate. Let's look at her actual SNP results. So the MTHFR677, that is a TT result. So this is two copies of the genetic variant, and the, geni the genotype is the homozygote there, and this indicates a deficiency up to 40% of function of the MTHFR enzyme. And recommendations would really revolve around increasing folate, so folates from green leafy vegetables, um, and a B vitamin rich diet, and you could consider some supplements, but they need to be used with caution. Then we have the second MTHFR SNP here, so that came back as an A to C call. So that's a heterozygote where we have one wild type copy and one um, genetic variant copy. And this could indicate up to a 20% loss of functioning. And again, the recommendation is very similar there. The MTR uh, again came back as a AG result, so again a heterozygote. And interestingly, this is a beneficial variant and may decrease homocysteine, but when we are um, cycling out homocysteine quite fast, we may find that we need an increased need of B12, so that would have to be taken into consideration. We have MTRR, that was a GG result, so that's two copies of the genetic variant. Uh, the genotype, therefore, is the homozygote, uh, leading to reduction in function of the gene. And that's an increased um, need for homocysteine or increased amount of homocysteine from that. Again, the recommendations are around the folate and the B vitamin rich diet. The CBS gene, uh, so the call came back as A to G. That's a heterozygote genotype, so one copy of the genetic variant and one copy of the wild type. Um, this um, enzyme limits homocysteine down into the downstream path. So that and that would be sort of limiting that. And around this, we need to ensure that adequate glutathione is in place through dietary recommendations, and that is following on through that pathway of the CBS enzyme. And finally, we have the Compt gene. And this came back as a GG result, so two copies of the wild type, so a wild type genotype there, um, really showing that there is adequate breakdown of dopamine from this um, SNP and that no action would be recommended at that stage based on that. So let's look at this um, in summary on back on that diagram again um, against the methylation cycle as a whole. So COMPT and MTR shown here uh, in the lighter green indicate a more normal functioning of these enzymes um, and we would not need to consider those as such at the moment. MTR indicates a possible reduction, so you can see that in the slightly lighter, um, darker green there, uh, a reduction in function, um, and this would limit production of methylcobalamin. Uh, and then we have CBS indicating a possible increase of function, and that's actually increasing the clearance of homocysteine, so we'd have to um, ensure that we had glutathione in place as the, cysteine, the homocysteine would be siphoned off for other pathways down to sort of the urea and the TCA cycle that way. Um, and finally, the um, genetic variations to two key SNPs on the MTHFR gene, these may lead to a significant reduction, so up to 60% reduction of function of this key enzyme uh, in the conversion of inactive folates 
So that includes folic acid to um, active methylfolate, which can be utilized by the methylation, methylation cycle. So you can see that uh, five methyl going around to the methyl. So how do we um, put this all together? Uh, the interpretation of this data shows that the client's lifestyle questionnaires indicate possible methylation dis disruptions. And additionally, the a genetic predisposition towards a reduced uh, methylation cycle. And, and this all equals a, a potential to have a severely compromised methylation, which may uh, relate back to her autoimmune status. So if we pull all this information together as a client protocol, um, the nutrition and lifestyle modification could include a by such as supporting methylation with active folate rich sources of foods and adequate cofactors such as zinc and magnesium so these are really important for the methylation cycle um, avoid supplementing with folic acid as um, it, she's likely not to be able to metabolize this and this would lead to a decrease in natural killer cells which would be undesirable um, moderating that exercise so making sure that it's low impact low stress so taking the toll off uh, stress pathways Putting in some techniques to reduce anxiety and stress, improving her sleep pattern, uh, possibly implementing a low toxin diet so you could take out sugar and alcohol, relieve the burden for those methyl factors on the liver, a healthy diet to include nutrients to support glutathione production. And finally, you could consider supplementing with some of the B vitamins and methylcobalamin and the 5-MTHFR. So these are all the active forms the methylated. But this can have some undesirable effects. So let's just quickly look at some of the side effects which you could encounter when supplementing with methylfolate. And I pulled up quite a list. So we've got muscle pain, irritability, anxiety, depression, joint pain, nausea, headaches, insomnia, seizures, vomiting, stomach pain, sweating, rash and palpitations. And interestingly, some of these would actually be present in an autoimmune case anyway. So it's really very important to track progress. Um, you could retake the stress, sleep and burnout questionnaires after two weeks and then maybe at 30 days, obviously you know your client better than anyone. And the goal, remember, is to really relieve that methylation burden. So we're not treating the SNP, we're treating the person as a whole. You can follow up after one month or maybe as two months as needed. They may need sort of sustained nutritional therapy for a number of months. And uh, just to re go over that, check that supplement need, go very slow and very low. And um, if you used my DNA Health um, for a genetic test, they would um, give you some advice around supplement need. They'd uh, be able to advise you there too. So how do you get started? Um, this is a key question that I get asked all the time. And seeing as many of you are just considering using nutrigenomics, it's quite relevant here. So first and foremost, it's something you've probably heard many times, treat the person and not the SNP. Learn the gene function, go in and really understand what's going on, that's going to really help you. Gain experience by practicing, um, attend case studies, um, read things in the CAM magazine, there's plenty of information about. Make sure that your genetic testing company provides you with excellent support, that's really very important. If your client is healthy, then support them through diet and lifestyle. Consider going through that route. And I think as nutritional therapists, we all would like to go back to just a pure diet and lifestyle advice if we could. But if they are symptomatic, you could continue, um, consider some further functional testing. So you could test them, um, look at organic acids, maybe look at methionine levels, homocysteine. Um, if you're going to start supplementing, please do this slowly. So go low and go slow and always, always follow up your client. So uh, just to wrap up now, some of the key learnings that we've really looked at. We've looked at autoimmune diseases being very complex and they're very hard to detect and how the medical establishment sort of um, uses that information in their sort of point of view and we've looked at our point of view. Um, we know that autoimmune diseases are a result of not only genetic variations but also environmental factors 
and very much an individual immune system response. Um, we've looked at the altered methylation status, the mechanisms involved in autoimmune cases, and then we also considered what we could actually, as nutritional therapists, what we could do about it. So take your holistic approach, um, taking into account those SNPs and the epigenetic factors, and then modify diet and lifestyle to fit the individual case um, in order to alleviate the symptoms. So um, if we just move on to questions, if anyone has any questions, I'll pass back to Sylvia. Thank you, Eve. That was great. We did have a few questions come in, so we'll start on those. I'll start with this one. How does dysbiosis relate to nutrigenomics and autoimmunity? Okay, so there's a lot of research linking bowel flora and autoimmunity. And a less uh, variable gut ecosystem is common in many autoimmune conditions. And, and this links to both a dis dysregulated immune system and natural detoxification system. And as we've seen, further pressure from genetic variants in, um, in immune function or in methylation capacity um, could lead to that perfect storm that we talked about of factors needed for the development of autoimmune disease. Great, thank you, Eve. Now, this is an interesting one. My client shows many signs of overmethylation, but has two autoimmune conditions. How is this possible? Right, so um, the epigenetic and nutrigenomic theory for autoimmunity is not straightforward, as we've seen. And um, this is a balancing act, particularly for the methylation, so it's quite complex. Um, for DNA methylation, there are low levels in immune-related gen genes and cells, but over-methylation can be seen in um, their non-coding promoter regions. So this is an area of DNA that um, helps to switch on or off that gene and could also lead to changes in gene expression. So I think um, there could be sort of a variable in that area. Okay, and what additional functional testing would you recommend in this case? So really, um, personally, I would look at um, the levels of um, homocysteine and methionine, some of the functional uh, organic acids that would come from the methylation cycle. There's uh, many different tests out there. Personally, I use um, doctor's data to look at this sort of panel. Um, you can um, use this to give you some further information and clues. I would always recommend functional testing if it's possible with your client. Great, thank you, Eve. And we have time for just another one question. So why are we more at risk of autoimmune conditions as we age? So um, we know that as we age, our immune system declines in function and logically this should dampen down autoimmune systems or symptoms. But um, paradoxically, low grade inflammation increases with age and particularly our poor lifestyle choices um, and our epigenetic modifications, these all accumulate with age. Um, and this leads to a decline in competence of the immune system and then there's that increased potential for loss of cell tolerance so effectively for th things to go wrong. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Eve. Thank you for this presentation and for your answers. Um, if you have any further questions, you can email us at practitioner at mydnahealth.co.uk and our practitioner support team will get back to you. We will send out the recording shortly after and we'll also add webinar notes with all your questions answered. And that's the end of the session. And if you enjoyed this webinar, you can register to our upcoming events. You can find more information at mydnahealth.co.uk. We have half a day BANT accredited workshop coming up in London and yet another webinar, this time on inflammation. Thank you all so much for attending and have a good evening.